Right. I believe I'm live. Um, how should I do this? Hello. Am I live? Hello, anybody? Leave me a comment if I'm coming through and you can hear me all right. Um, I'll put these assassin bugs back. Hello, Drew Woodward. How are you today? So, I have been making some enclosures up for some new isopods and also just for surplus. So, typically, this is the setup I typically go with now. I'm very good, Drew. Thank you. So, I have four on the top, and these are 38 millimeter hole saw. Um, you use a battery drill, drill a little pilot hole with a smaller drill bit, and then you go through with a hole saw, um, clean up the holes with a lighter or something like that, just to smooth it out a bit. And then on the side, on one side, I go for one hole, and that's obviously either side, yeah. and then two on the end. And then as you can see on the other end, I have two again. Now, it probably doesn't pick up very well on the camera, but I do have Tully fabric, which I am trying out for some vent material. So on this one that I luckily drilled earlier, I have some of these little squares that I've cut out of the mesh. And it's just a really fine, quite rigid mesh. Um, if anyone would like to hop on, um, if if Stefan, if you want to sort of join and give me someone to sort of chat to while I'm doing this, then that'd be great. Um, extremely nervous, so just uh, just let me know. And then for the actual gluing process, I've got this bad boy, which is the Bosch PKP 18E corded glue gun. And uh, I learnt my lesson yesterday. It gets a lot hotter than my old one. Um, as you can see by the little burn I've got on my finger. So I'm going to plug this in now. It won't take very long to heat up. And uh, I've just got some cheap Amazon glue sticks. Nothing fancy. Um, I think it's like 50 glue sticks for a tenner. So I'll get a few in there. That way they're easier to get. And they're just these uh, clear glue sticks made for like arts and crafts. So while I'm waiting for the glue gun to heat up, I'll show you one of my recent isopod setups. And you can see how it's kind of implemented once everything's in place. So this is an older setup so the ventilation is slightly different but the idea is the same um, and this is for a porcelio species uh, how many liters is the tub these are 11 liter wham tubs um, they're made in great britain out of polypropylene which is extremely extremely stable under heat, humidity, everything like that. So it's a really good plastic to use. If you're going to get a tub, I advise polypropylene or um, polyethylene terephthalate, which is your, your pet plastic that um, all of your Coke bottles are made out of. 
that stuff is obviously really safe. Um, it doesn't leach out chemicals. It is um, no parabens, etc., like that. And uh, 11 litres is more than enough for a hobbyist. Um, I do know people that keep some isopods in very high numbers and they'll go up to like a 35 litre, um, like a tub like that. But in theory, if you're going bigger, all you need to do is scale this up. You know, so a big cork bark, bigger bit of moss, more leaves, etc. So the one crystal tubs you can get on Amazon for five of them for about, um, I think I pay about 20 quid, but that's Amazon Prime. You can probably get um, five of them slightly cheaper if you're going for, you know, snail mail delivery and wait in a few days. So... <clears throat> After this glue gun's heated up and we get the patches on, you'll see how I kind of do that process and then we'll get some substrate in there and make a, a pseudo setup for some new isopods. But just as a, a feature, these are my Porcelio um, Sevilla Caramel Morph. And these are the babies from my original 13 I got from Adam Webb over at uh, micro exotics i'm a little bit slow today um it is purely and simply just initial nerves really um so you can see just a, a nice bit of cork bark for these porcelio species especially the spanish ones you want a lot of like natural material so um a lot of leaves some rotten wood so i've got like chunks of rotten wood in here and then i've also got uh, a small patch of moss so this moss it's only like the corner from there. And when I missed, I only missed around the outside, which is why you get the watermarks. And that's because this species does really well with less humidity. So when I do a bit of a watering, I'll literally just come in and the other sides. And that is it. Because if you go too much, they will get... Um, Overhydrated, and then they can also get like malt issues. They won't breed as well because it's too humid for them. Um, so Spanish species are not for beginners, but they're a really good like step up from someone like a Porcelio labis. Um, so I'm really happy with these. I got down to eight females, and both my males died, and then suddenly all these babies started popping up. So. Hopefully we'll get a few more people popping in. If anyone can share the stream and uh, get us some more viewers, then that'd be great. But I'm really happy to just see two people at least because, you know, it's, it's better than none. I've got some big plans coming up soon. Um, I'll be interviewing Wally Kern on the 14th of June. Um, that'll be 8 p.m. here, 2 p.m. in the U.S. or 9 p.m. if you're in Central Europe. Um, and that will be a general interview about um, isopods, about his geckos, his personal experience with keeping, um, and obviously a bit about himself. And it should be really good. I mean, Wally's one of my absolute idols. Um, I really, I, I can't speak highly enough of him. He's such a lovely guy um, and really, really top class. Um, again, the likes of Aquarimax Pets, Russ. Another really great guy, another really nice guy. But um, yeah, Wally was was one of those that when I got in touch with him, he was just as good as he was on the camera. And I think that makes a massive difference because you obviously, sometimes you meet your idols and uh, they're not as forthcoming or they're too busy, which is more than fair enough in this kind of setup where you've got your, your face in the camera every day sort of showing people what you're doing and and what kind of projects you're doing and it takes a hell of a lot of time so to have someone that will actually put time aside for you is absolutely brilliant and having him agree to it was just it was like a dream come true because it would be absolutely brilliant to talk face to face with one of the people that really got me into this hobby in the first place so Starting off with these uh, mesh pieces, my glue gun is hot enough. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we will be able to start gluing these down. I place them over, so I've got 
enough mesh on the outside and uh, I put them on the inside. Now, a lot of people will probably think, well, wouldn't it be better to put it on the outside? I find that on the inside, it's a bit um, sort of cleaner to have a look um, as someone sort of like viewing your collection. So for me, it's more of an aesthetic thing. Um, it also gives the isopods a little bit of climbing because sometimes you'll see them have a little bit of a climb on the mesh. And I don't necessarily have a problem with that because I know that the babies can't reach it. So I don't get escapes from it. And having it inside just for me keeps it a lot tidier. Um, yeah, the glue guns are just, it doesn't matter how careful you are, even when you're finishing and that, like I was literally just finishing the other night and, uh, I got bit by this beast. So, uh, yeah, you, you gotta be careful when you're doing stuff like this in terms of like, um, Ophi and Ophi's dads. Um, I'm sure that when you're doing the, the gluing and that you, uh, make sure that she's keeping her things away from the tip. But that's the main thing. Same as the soldering iron. You don't touch anything past sort of here because that's where it starts getting warm. And the further up you get, the hotter it will get. Even this rubber, you'd think you'd be able to touch that. You can't, you know. So just keep away from this bit. Treat it like a gun. This is your business end. This is your safe end. Stay at the safe end and you're all good. And uh, what I'm going to show you here probably looks like I'm completely ignoring that, but I trust you. I'm out of the way, it's the angle of the camera. So all I do is I put a little dot and then I kind of smush it. So that gives me an anchor point. And I always do like a little swirl because it seems to get the uh, angel hair a little bit uh, under control. You know, you're still gonna have a load of wispy bits, that's just glue guns in general, but it keeps it more under control. And then after a couple of seconds, I come over, and what I do is I basically keep this tight so it keeps it nice and flat. And then I will keep in my hand away from it. I'm still about half an inch away from the hot end. And I'll just do a bit here. And what that does then is that gives me a good platform to then go round and to start doing the main seal around the hole. So if I go around now, I go halfway and like, if you see it sort of bunch up at all, you want to kind of point outwards as if you're trying to sort of pull it out a bit tight again. And as you run out of glue, you just want to stick another one in the end, same as usual. So you just put it in and then that's loaded so you can carry on. And then... I literally just fill in the rest because you can never have enough and if you've got it on hand it really pays to do a nice amount of glue because in my eyes it gives a better bond thank you so much Rick that is really really kind of you um, if you want to at some point mate you're more than welcome to to hop on and sort of have a have a bit of a chat but I understand if you're just having a watch and you you want to sit down with family or whatever you do because it is about 2 p.m so no doubt you're uh, having a bit of a chill hi Diana I hope you're good uh, where did where did I say I got the mesh from so I got this mesh from eBay. Uh, if I can find my roll, I can show you what it comes in. Uh, give me two seconds. I've had a massive re rejig of the uh, of all my stuff. So although it's really tidy, the stuff that was here is now put away, which is great if you're uh, looking neat, but not really looking to do stuff. <laughs> but it's called Tully Fabric, T-U-L-L-E. And the other stuff I've got is a more rigid mesh. And that is just um, 
caravan mesh and I just get it from eBay. Um, I can't can't find it at the moment. I'm really sorry about that. But um, yeah, so caravan mesh and tully fabric. So this tully fabric is what a lot of mantis people use as a molten surface. And uh, it's really key to uh, sort of provide that for a mantis. But for isopods, it just gives a really good ventilation. It's nice and lightweight, lets plenty of air through. And it's still quite rigid, so it's nice and safe to use. Um, if you want, Drew, find me on Instagram or find me on Facebook. I'll be under Scott Rivers or I've got a page for this. And uh, I'll send you over some links of the ones I personally purchased. So you can get the exact same one as me if you're in the UK. So moving on to our second square now. Um, you don't need to be as neat as me. You can do it as circles. So on these ones up here, I've just got circles. That was when I was using white caravan mesh. Um, so you can see it's a bit more obvious where the vent is. And then I've got the other black ones there. But I find cutting circles out is a bit of a overstep. It's kind of very, very nice to look at, but takes forever. <laughs> so I just cut squares now. And when you get up to about 15 isopod colonies, I've got 14 at the moment. So it really pays to kind of get it done quick and cheerful rather than taking ages and it looking really pretty because these are great pets, but quite often they're also breeders for, for selling on. So if you've got something that works, is functional, it's a lot easier than having something that looks really pretty like, some people will keep isopods in an exo terror and I, I i think it's great i think give your animals the best you can but it's excessive for the requirements and the needs of the animal you know you're not talking about a snake or a amphibian or whatever that needs specific ventilation and, and requirements like that the only thing with these is your humidity and your ventilation and you know, you can do all of that by just changing vent patterns, vent size, and um, like how you space it out, etc. And that, like some species, like Cubaris, you probably don't want as much airflow as Spanish isopods that need a lot of airflow. And if I'm really honest, this um, pattern of ventilation is really made for the Spanish Porcelio isopods. Um, and the reason for that is there's just ample airflow. It's basically just completely free flowing to give the best possible ventilation going. Um, whereas something like an armadillidium is really good to have the extra airflow, but it's not needed. And if you've got a species that like it a bit damper and need airflow, you could definitely half this amount of vents and not have to mist it as often. But for me, I quite enjoy doing my mistings. I quite enjoy that kind of therapeutic um, side of the keeping. So I'm quite happy to have more ventilation and have a tank that dries out quicker because it means I get more interaction um, with the isopods. And even if I'm not picking up their hide and having a look at where they are and just leaving them to it, it's still nice to make sure. And it, it gives me the opportunity just to check over, see if anything's molding, anything's you know, not quite there. But you can see it's it's really not a difficult process and this is more than enough for your your isopod setups. Um you know, with a reptile you might need specific lighting or UVB, but these are animals that live in decaying matter, eat decaying matter and are reverted to any kind of light anyway. So some people will even go to the fact of keeping them in dark tinted tubs so i know some people like my business partner jack he'll keep a few of these species in a blacked out um really useful box rather than a clear one and in theory and from his personal experience he has found that they sometimes breed a bit better in the lowest light possible because they're not naturally out in light they're not naturally looking for an open space 
So while I'm doing this, has anyone else got any questions for me? I'm more than happy to answer. And if there's any other um, sort of suggestions for anything you'd like to see at a future point in time for a live stream, then that would be great. Um, and while I'm talking about sort of like the future lives and that, I will be going live on Thursday night with uh, Scott's Inverts, so Scott Tasker, and um, Bailey's Bug Block, which is Andrew Bailey. You might have seen him on Exotics Radio a couple of times. Really great guys, and it should be quite a good, quite a good stream. So that will be on this channel as well. And uh, I've got Scott working on the thumbnail as we speak. So hopefully we'll be able to put that on our Instagrams and uh, get that pushed out. But it was uh, an idea I had the other day and it should be really good. You know, three like-minded lads having a nice chat. Uh-oh, that's the trouble with Scott Law. What do you mean, Diana? Are we talking about Scott Tasker or me? <laughs> Hi, Moon. So we've got seven viewers. That's absolutely insane. I'm really, really happy with that. And thank you all for showing up. It really means the world to me as I'm so nervous about this kind of thing and it's really a, a big step. But with Cracks having to call it early because of like family events, etc., I thought I might as well get some practice in before I, before I interview the big man himself, Mr. Wally Kern over at Supreme Gecko. And I'm, I'm so excited about it. I mean, I'm sure you can tell because I won't, I won't shut up about it for the next few weeks. So, uh, Stefan and Ophi have got their work cut out because I'll probably be messaging them all the time about it. Creeping Crawley, how are you? Let me know if the stream's all right, guys. Um, obviously, if the quality drops, I'd like to know. Um, I'll join for a chat if you want to soon tonight. I'll send you a link, Diana. I'll just put one in the chat for you. Um, when I work out how to do it. Invite a guest. Copy to clipboard. That should be copied. And then... Post comment. I'm learning as I go. Hopefully that goes up. So, yeah, when you're ready, Diana, you should be able to join through that. Um, you just need to create a um, display name and then you'll be able to, to pop on. I think you've already done a, a stream before on the Lads Night In, haven't you? So you probably know. So at the moment, guys, if we're looking at it, we've done four out of six vents on the side panels. And these are pretty much the easy bit. Um, none of it's hard it's just with these wham tubs you do get a contour on the lid so we've got like a ribbing that you need to kind of get around and I'll show you a really good method for that in a sec <coughs> I really wish I had a drink up here <laughs> so With this Tully fabric, it really is invisible. Um, so it's easy to lose track of it. It's always good to sort of keep it out of the way of any breezes or anything like that so it doesn't go flying around your room because the second it moves from where it was, you really find it difficult to find it. It's not just on the camera, it's in general. But, uh, you know, in, in general, it's harder to use than the coarse mesh. It's easier to use than the really super fine Mantis mesh, and it's stronger than the really super fine Mantis mesh. And the only alternative that other people might use that I absolutely detest is tights material. So 
tights material is um, a really, really good thing for like absolutely minuscule critters because they, they won't get through it. So when I had my Thai Pink Dragon Millipedes, I had to stick tight on the outside and it's really stretchy, which you think would be great, but the glue doesn't want to go through the fabric. So it's a, it's a real pain to try and get sorted. And the guys over at Lads Night Inn, um, Stone Circle Tarantulas, that pet page and Angel and Tom's Arachnids found it hilarious when I was typing in the chat about how I was really struggling with these tights and couldn't really uh, get a hang of gluing them down and that they thought I was I thought I was being a weirdo when actually I was just trying to make an enclosure but uh, it's always a good laugh with them and you know Stefan hops on really good fun but um, this new glue gun is absolutely brilliant it's so much easier to use before I'd have like real big problems with my hands if I was doing this much glue because as I'm pushing it, it puts a pressure here and then it feels kind of like I've, um, oh, it's really hard to explain, but you know, when you get pinched by something and then you get that pressure feeling when you go to touch something, it's like that. And it was absolutely horrible. And that was a, a Loctite glue gun. Um, I think it was 70 watt and this is 200 watt. So this one gets a lot hotter and it's a lot quicker. Um, it just chucks the glue out. In a second, I'll show you what kind of rate it puts out because it's so much easier. The only thing that I do notice is the metal nozzle catches on the mesh a little bit, but it's really easy to get used to once you've kind of adjusted how you apply the glue. And you might see that the plastic kind of flexes a bit, but that's nothing to worry about. That's just the heat slightly warping it. It's... Um, if anything, I think it's a slightly good thing because it means that it's getting a really good bond because obviously two hot surfaces will bond better than one hot to one cold, same as when you're soldering or doing something with a, a hot adhesive process. Um, but if I get some of this tissue, which is absolutely brilliant if we get another panic buy because I keep a couple of rolls of toilet roll just for little bits like wiping um, insect gunk if I have to cut a mealworm off or whatever for like a pre-kill and stuff like that. So it's really good in case we uh, get the panic buyers coming out of their caves again. But you can see this just pumps out the glue really, really good, really fast. And without burning myself, there's a lot there. So I'll leave that to dry. Try not to put my hand on it on the stream. Don't want to get banned for colourful language. Um, naturally, it will just be like orange, purple, green, you know. I can promise you it won't be. Some very choice words were said the other night. In fact, I'll cover that with the other side of the paper and then that's fine. Right, last square of the sides. Has anyone said any more questions? Not yet. Oh, eight viewers now. Awesome. I really didn't expect this many viewers to start off with, so I'm really happy. Um, if anyone has shared, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. This wasn't planned. This was a uh, spur of the moment um, decision when I found out that Crax was unable to do her full tuesday stream so this won't be a regular thing on tuesdays um although it may happen in the future if a similar event comes up um and obviously if the exotics radio podcast doesn't go ahead um at any point in time i'm more than happy to think of something we can do and if i can get a couple of people that would be happy to sort of jump on and have a chat at somewhat short notice then that would be absolutely brilliant as well because as much as I am hopefully doing well, it is quite unnerving just talking to yourself, doing a setup and glancing at a chat for the moment. But hopefully Diana will be with us soon. Getting very excited for Donny. Um, bank account is dreading it though. I can imagine, mate. Have you got any uh, 
specific things that you're after. Um, I can think of a lot of snakes that I would love, but uh, I don't really have the room, so I've got to be happy with what I've got. So as you can see, we've done all of our side vents, got them all gone. Um, obviously, the ones that we've done earlier go a bit of a milky colour. And the main thing is, even though it's not a consistent um, bead of glue, you just want to make sure that there's definitely no obvious escape tunnel or anything like that. And then you're completely fine. You can press on it. It's, it's, it's strong. Um, so we'll move this out of the way. And before we start on the lid, I'll pick out a tub and we'll have a look and see what we've got in there just for a bit of variety so i showed you spanish isopods last time we'll move over to a different species excuse me i've got a bit of hiccups i had i think they were chili and garlic sausages but you know like the spiral ones and uh my God, were they good, but they've really given me hiccups. Oh, we've got the... Yes. Add to stream. Hello, Diana. Hello, Scott. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, Which is your favourite isopod? Uh, my favourite isopod is my brand new ones, which I'll show you quickly. Um, they've not been featured on my channel yet. And these were a gift from Jack. Um, so obviously Jack is the guy that I'm in business with. Um, so he's a really, really great guy. Um, knows a lot about keeping isopods and the different species, etc. He's got a number of different species. But these are Cubaris Panda Kings. So I'll get this one off and put it on my hand. They're still babies, are they? Yeah. Yeah, these are just juveniles, but they're absolutely brilliant. I love them. They're like my second favourite compared to um, rubber duckies. Yeah, they're but funny. They're these funny. are a bit out of quite a few people's price range. These are typically sort of £50 for sort of five up to sort of a 100 and something oh pound. God. for. They're really expensive. Yeah. Panda kings are lucky. usually about twenty pounds each. You're very lucky. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. Our friendship actually started when I made my reptile group dino. So my pioneer and advanced reptile keepers, mm -hmm. I was setting up for a clean up crew for my boa, and I joined his group, which at the time was ICP, isopod and millipede keepers uh, UK only, I believe was what his original name for it was. And now the group is actually called Pioneering Isopod and Millipede Keepers UK only um, because we actually merged. But the initial friendship was I gave him some um, promotion and that and got his group, which was on about 70 members at the time. We got up to 400 members in, I think it was about a month and a half with my help. And uh, ever since, we've been really good friends, and he's done me some amazing, amazing isopods over sort of the year that we've known each other. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, these were my initial isopods I got from him, and these are the clowns. Oh, my God, there's a ton there. Yeah. They're doing really well now. And uh, the babies that have having... probably eat all the one guy. Oh yeah. In in all fairness, he loves, he loves um, the woodlouse. Yeah, people don't see woodlice as as worthy feeders, but they're just as good as your your crickets and your locusts and that. As long as you mix it in and you give a really good um, what do you call it variety. So, for example, if I if I unhook myself. And go freestyle. I'll put the light over here. You can see I've got yes. waxworms, I've got two tubs of waxworms, fruit flies, buffalo worms, mini mealworms, and normal mealworms just there. And that's just for my 
assassin bugs, my scorpions, oh, and, okay. uh, my other inverts. So if I'm giving bugs that and you're just giving a bearded dragon or whatever animal you've got, um, mealworms, nothing else, then uh, mm. I think that's the whole reason I started my reptile group. Because, you know, personally, I don't want to say... Are we all right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to say... Night night. Oh, no worries. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't want to throw shade on anyone, but if that's what you're doing, I think uh, get on to pioneering advanced reptile keepers and we'll put you in the, the right direction to, to really kick up that husbandry and, and go that bit further. Because there's so many different insects and different animals you can really feed. Yeah. Um, I've run out of orange ones. Somebody you run out of orange ones? Yeah. Okay, well, if you if you get in touch with me, I'll sort you out some. Um, I'll, I'll do you a good job. I'll do you a good deal. Okay, you know, we'll, speak, we'll speak again. Yeah. It's hilarious. Look, he goes absolutely crazy when he sees the woodlouses. Yeah. Because it was really unfortunate, because when you was kind of talking to me about it, everyone's yeah. everything sort of hit you, didn't it? So you had all birthdays coming up and everything like that. But... Yeah. <laughs> we had like three in, like, th I think when we first started talking, it was quite a few. <laughs> yeah, because it was your little girl first, wasn't it? And then it was a couple of others. And... No, no, she's too soon. Oh, right, yeah. But I was talking, oh, ready, and then someone else cropped up. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So, as it always does. So, who else is in the chat? Oh, we've got Angel and Tom in the house. How are you? Um, Drew Woodward saying, uh, dream reptile, question mark, and favourite in my collection. So, oh, and he's after garters. That's really good. Um, so, my favourite reptile in my collection is my Hog Island Boa. Um, which is Rocky, and Rocky is absolutely brilliant. He is so placid and so calm. It's really, you know, I couldn't ask for better. He's been perfect from day one. Um, my dream reptile, however, is a white-lipped python, and they come from Indonesia, um, and they are absolutely stunning. Uh, Stefan's not got his cam. No, I was going to say Stefan's not waking. I'm just sorting out. Might just be sorting out something at home and then it'll be uh, popping on. Maybe. But yeah, for this one, um, when you start this off, I typically do what I normally do and put like a corner down. Let that, that go. To, is that to melt it or are you sticking the plastic on it? Um, so I've got the, the mesh on here. So these ones I just do like a longer reptile, uh, reptile rectangle. And I will stick a corner on. So you can see there I've got that tacked. And then what I'll do next, I'll do a line. And then each one of these dips, I do progressively going along so i'll do the line down here to get that fabric in and down then i'll do the filler in the middle and do the line across here and so on and so on so you'll see as i go okay cool i'll try and hide this up stefan's, uh, internet's, up. Playing up. stefan's internet's always playing up <laughs> he needs i wonder if we have conversations step. but He's all right, though. He'll be on at some point, probably. Unfortunately, yeah. Uh, I don't know well, who his internet is for, Stephens or Tom's. Well, yeah, there's that. <laughs> it's a bit of a competition between those two, I think. Yeah. So. Although it is fun seeing Tom's Paul's face. Oh, don't. I it's always, a, is he I thinking a, or is he I paused? took a screenshot. Oh, I'll send it to you tomorrow. I <laughs> took a screenshot of the last one. Yeah. It was funny. <laughs> so what you find with these is sometimes it kicks out a bit. 
so you can see it's kind of veering off yeah. as long as you kind of make sure that when you come to this bit you've got enough that you can cover around the vent you're good um, and another way of doing it could be splitting these two vents slightly further apart and doing squares like I do on the other ones if you're not quite confident enough um, another thing if you've got top vents they're not really going to escape out of top vents so using a very small drill bit and just doing like a, a pepper in of drill bit like holes would also be quite um, effective I'm good Tom <laughs> oh Tom that's not a poor space <laughs> <laughs> is that why Angel's never on the stream <laughs> probably I think she come on once when I, the first time that I come on I said hello yeah she pops on every so often She's like the celebrity. Everyone sees Angel and they're like, oh, hi, Angel. <laughs> Poor Tom just sat there like, I've been here the whole stream. No one says hello to me. <laughs> yeah. Or Tom just gets picked on. Yeah. It's disappointing his shelves not falling down yet, though. It's all right. I'm going to set up a mug soon and I'll send it to him and it'll be the one that does it. <laughs> I'll try and find somewhere that does a custom pint mug. You know, like the big mugs? Yeah. And I'll send him one of them and see if that will just push it over the edge. You mean like the Sports Direct giant big one? Yeah, that's it. I've got one that just says coffee a ton of times. <laughs> I used to use it to defrost the um, frozen thawed stuff, but then eventually it just got to a point where the frozen, frozen thawed stuff was just... Um, getting a bit too big because with the burrow he's on small mice now uh, is he not that big then oh hello uh, the back. But small mice I meant small rats so he's on small adult rats now there he is there he is <laughs> Dara, how long is it? are you alright but I'm here until it cuts out <laughs> awesome so hopefully we get a nice pause for you. Fingers crossed, yeah. yeah. He will oh, love you for that, but I'm sure he will. Cut out and then it'll be on and then it'll cut out and then it'll be on. Is your internet really that bad, Stefan? It wasn't when we first got it. It's only literally been the past week, week and a half, that it's been playing up. Are you on Virgin? Sky. Sky. I'm All right, well, when on the 17th, if I get permission from Shan, um, I'm happy to pop over and see if I can have a look on your router settings and um, try and split the channels. Because if you've got 2.4G and a 5G, sometimes mm. they'll cross talk and argue with each other and then it makes really rubbish internet. Yeah. So if I split them up, you'll have two Wi Fi networks, but they'll both be stable. One will be a bit longer range and one will be a bit faster. All right, yeah. We'll try that, but um, yeah. that's completely up to you, mate. I'm always happy to, to sort of lend a hand. More experience with Virgin because that's what I've got, but um, you know, they're all pretty much the same. And I'm sure if I yeah. have a look online, I can find what I need to find, and then I'll have the experience to do it anyway. Yeah, you're crazy with that hot sauce, though, Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's a, a bit yeah. of news coming up in there. This is only the beginning. Yeah. How is it? He's getting me involved soon. Uh-oh. <laughs> I've got loads planned. Diana, was you not on the live stream when um I downed that little Jaeger bottle of Wayne's sauce, the V2? No, I saw Stefan trying it, but not okay. the other one. Is that when yeah. I... You tried it before it was made, the concentrate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, that was bad. brilliant. Yes, that That's was quite evil funny. Stuff. Horrible. You can Wait, yeah, it's evil talk. stuff. It's nice. You're flavor. saying it's evil, but then you put it on everything now. Every day you're sending me a different video of you putting it on something. <laughs> I reckon that that sauce probably feels like this touching your tongue. It's probably a comparable pain. 
I think he's frozen. Yeah, probably. I mean, at so least he's he, got a better pause face. He hasn't done a silly pause face like um, Tom does. <laughs> But yeah, which Stefan. Ice, which ice pods is this house you're making for? So this is good for any pods, um, from Hoffman Seggy down to dwarf whites. If you're really inclined to keep dwarf whites, then uh, this will still do them perfectly fine. Uh, how big do the whites get? Actually, I was going to. The ask dwarf you. whites. Um, Trichorina tormentosa get to, I believe, a maximum of about five mil long. Um, really not long at all. Well, I've got I've got white wood last, but they're not very big at all, so I don't know whether they are dwarf ones. Yeah, the likelihood is. Um, did you buy them as white wood lice, or did you? Yeah. Yeah. Were they called tropical white? Yeah. Yeah, they're Trichorina tormentosa. They're a burrowing species, and uh, they're the bane of most lice pod keepers in existence because a lot of people they'll keep them to try and sell them but then they'll get in every other bin and out compete everything else and then you end up with big problems like that so if you're keeping them in a colony mm. then um they're not ideal to really keep anywhere near other wood lice but if you're keeping them in a setup then you're all right because as cleanup crew they will have a slightly different role being more subterranean than the they are, more they surface. Are in, they, are, they are now in with my leopard gecko. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect for them, actually. So as I long as they can them. handle the dryness. Well, I, I, spray, I spray it every other day. Yeah. So, did, did I tell you I've, st I've got, still got two leopard gecko eggs? Have you? Mm-hmm. So, I haven't got an incubator, so I'm just trying to do them in with her. Yeah. But this, this isn't is... ideal, and I don't advise it for other people, but what I've just done is risk a slight burn on my finger to try and get that edge in, because what I hadn't realised is the kick across had gone a bit too far. The other thing you can do is try and rip this back up and readjust it. But for me, I'm happy that that's going to be enough. Oh, okay. So it's really important to sort of... No, I, I realise you shouldn't do it, but I wasn't prepared. Because At I'm the end of the day, in the wild, they're with mum. But in captivity, you get the best chance of keeping them and having them alive if they are in their own incubator, kept at the perfect condition. Because in the tank, you won't have enough space to create a perfect incubating condition. But if you can I make them pull through, I then... I seem to be doing all right. It's only the first one because she was, it was young. So I was like, I'll give it a try and just see if it doesn't work or they don't hatch. Mm. I'm not one. The other thing you could do is just get a cheap OVIV from Facebook Marketplace. And it sounds really janky, but you get a cheap viv from Facebook Marketplace. You get your Tupperware container. As long as it comes with a heat mat and a thermostat, you set that up for your temps, you put the eggs in the tub with the vermiculite and you keep the viv at the right temperature. And in theory, that's the same exact thing as a reptile incubator. Yeah, that's pretty much what I've done. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. at the end of the day, as long as you can keep the humidity somewhat right for the eggs and the temperature right, it doesn't matter what you're incubating them in, you're, you're incubating them. It's, it's the same principle. Um, yeah. It's not ideal. It's not what, I would advise for people to do, but in your situation, you're trying to give them the best chance of survival rather than chucking them out and saying, I can't really do this. Yeah, that's why. I So they're sort of sharing a heat map with mum. <laughs> yeah. So, Drew, my question to you is where are you keeping them? Are they in a tub on their own or are they with um, a reptile in a viv? Because if they're with a viv, I'll show you what I do in that situation, which is under here. I don't know if you can see at the back, but I have a plant pot over the vent. 
just here. Oh, yeah, that's clever. And what that does is that stops any wood lice being able to escape through that vent. And it also means I can have the substrate higher, which is why I always also put these in as well. And then the weather stripping stops any escapes from that as well. So that You're might be really a little bit. For escapees. Yeah. Unfortunately, my corn snake likes messing up all the um, plant pots. So they don't really work in the corn snake. And with powdered oranges, powdered whites and powdered greys, it's not really ideal because that is literally the species that would get out because they're so small when they're babies. Yeah. So now we've got our container. It's got all the vents done. Um, the main thing to do is make sure you unplug this. Don't leave this on because, A, you probably risk a house fire if you're really, really unprepared and you don't see it for like a few days maybe, but even in the short term, you're going to move it, forget any you've left it plugged in and you're going to burn yourself like no one's business. So I always unplug it, put it somewhere safe, make sure that the lead isn't going to drag it off the, say, uh, off of the side and uh, just set it to, to cool down and always cool it down for like double the time that you think you need because with this new one, I realised it takes a lot longer to cool down. <laughs> yeah everyone's every piece of equipment is different that's a normal farm and that's the farm that touched the, the glue gun so Oops. all good fun but then i'm accident prone so yeah where are we i'm almost certain that they're coming from my god as exoterra they are also eating my plants at the moment so i'm not in the best terms with them at the moment. Plant pot idea is a genius idea. Thank you very much, Drew. Um, in an exoterra, um, you can get some really, really super fine mesh or some, um, what do you call it, tight material, if you can get along with it. Put it over the front bar so that there's still airflow going through, but instead of being like one mil holes, it's like microscopic. And then... If you go for the top vents as well, in case they can get through the top vents. Oh, I'm ignoring Stefan, sorry. <laughs> He's back. He's back. <laughs> How long for? <laughs> Maybe about five minutes. Oh, uh, that's all right then. But yeah, if you are worried about the top vents as well, the only thing I can suggest for those is make sure you close them and if you're not looking at taking things in and out, you could even do a temporary seal with hot glue um, to make sure that they're, they're kept in place. Um, thank you very much, Moon, for saying to hit the like button. It would be great if everyone can. Um, and I'm, I'm really hoping that you're all enjoying this. From the looks of it, you are. We've still got seven viewers. I'm guessing it's gone down from eight because Stefan's in the stream now. Or at least that's what I'm hoping. Um, if someone's left, then... Uh, you're missing out. <laughs> missing out on the best bit. So, Millipede Substrate. This comes from Shropshire Exotics. Um, .co.uk. The guy's called Nick Richards on Facebook. Absolutely amazing guy. Really, really nice guy. Um, another one that I helped from day one with um, Jack as well. So, this What's is the Millipede Sub. about that substrate? So, basically, with this substrate, it's heavily decayed organic matter, um, good quality topsoil, um, peat, moss, um, what do you call it? Like um, rotten wood and that in here as well. No cocoa fibre at all because cocoa fibre will kill millipedes. And the only difference between the, uh, the millipede and the ice pod substrate pretty much is the ratio of... Um, ingredients so this millipede substrate will have more rotten wood and more um soil whereas the ice pod substrate will have a little bit more leaves and a bit more um like it'll have some cocoa fiber because it's um less of a, a risk and they, they don't typically eat the soil so they don't get impacted like the millipedes do oh, okay. so this is basically just like a, a high quality premix similar to your Arcadia Earth mix and that sort of idea. So can they come in five liters. Is that safe to use with millipedes? 
Uh, the Pardon? One. Um, well, it hasn't got the stuff that he needs, so uh, the Arcadia being a reptile substrate is purely and simply worm castings, probably some black soldier fly larvae, um, fertilizer type material, and uh, you know, some topsoil and stuff like that. So, all that really does it gives the bioactive side of stuff a really good medium to grow in. Oh, we lost him again. Stefan's doing a tom. Yeah. Um, but that will basically give you um, everything you need for a reptile, but it doesn't give you any nutrition because a reptile is not going to be eating the substrate, or at least it shouldn't be. No. So that's the main thing. But obviously with any substrate and that, you get it on your hands. It's, it's part and parcel of the job, really. So... Yeah. I advise using cocoa, um, cocoa bark, uh, cork bark, but I also foraged some natural oak bark pieces. So this is some oak bark that I got from a local woodland. Um, ideally for isopods, you want a concave structure, but as this is just a demonstration, this is a flat piece. Um, some species do really good. It's okay, Stefan. It was good that you tried. Um, hopefully another week we'll be able to catch her. But, um, yeah, so some species will do all right with flat. Other species will really need, like, a concave piece that curves so they can get off the substrate. But for demonstration purposes, we'll put this in here. So that's where they'll all huddle under and hide. And then your main thing is your leaves. So... We'll get some leaves in here and you just sprinkle these in. You want a decent amount um, and obviously they eat this over time so it's something you will need to, to reorder and keep on top of and in um, bioactive setups that's something that some people neglect. They don't really replenish the leaves. They see that the leaves have been eaten and then they don't really go and get some more. So that's a really good tip. Just make sure you keep on top of your leaves. Do you um, get them from the wild or do you pre-buy your leaves? <clears throat> so these were from Nick again. Um, but I have got some beech leaves that I foraged. Um, I'm brave enough to use them. But uh, while I've got the ones from an actual supplier, um, I feel more comfortable with it. Because in theory, if the leaves weren't quite right or whatever it's their fault and so then i feel less bad about it you know if i'm buying it from someone that says they're sterilized and they're safe and they're prepared in that hmm. then it's a lot better than me worrying about if i've done it right or if i've done this if i've done that you know yeah so i think for a lot of people that keep isopods they will not necessarily forage as much as they can because they are worried about chemicals and fertilizers, etc. So the people that have these bioactive companies will naturally do the same thing as what you would do, but they just know what they're doing and they're comfortable with their process, etc. You know, it works for them, so they're happy to send out. And I think that's a big step for people keeping isopods and, and inverts is when you learn to do your own stuff, you save a lot of money but it's a hell of a stressful thing to start off with because you'll be constantly worrying if you've picked up one leaf and it's got like a deadly toxin on it, you know? Yeah. Have you have you done any of the creature crates? I haven't yet. I'm in talks about doing one. Um, the only thing is I can't keep tarantulas. I'm not technically allowed and I'm not quite ready. So because a main thing about the creature crate is there's usually a tarantula in the box. I've spoke to Robbie and I'm um, hopefully getting one around the 26th. So it'll be like the next run after this run. So I believe this one's mighty and bitey, I believe is what it's called. Yeah. Um, and then the next one will be obviously a different theme. We don't know yet, but he's going to, get in touch with like the supplier etc and that and like the guy that he's working with 
and they're going to do me one without a, a tarantula and, and think about someone else they can put in for me, which is really good. Yeah. Um, I do think it's a one-off, but it, it will be really good for them because obviously it gives them the promotion that I'd like to give them um, without me having to... You know, why can't, get why, a can't you, why can't you keep tarantulas? Just asking. Um, so I'm scared of tarantulas, but the main thing is like family, etc. Uh -huh. I know Stefan would have had it off me, and you know, if it comes to it, and they sent me a tarantula anyway, it, Stefan would be the person that I would give it to because he's local, he's really good with his animals, really takes care and. I see you second yeah. put you would have had it in the chat. Yeah. So this is rotten wood. Um, this piece is a little bit hard at the moment, but as it goes in and over time, it will soften up and it will again rot out. But you can see as I drag my finger across it, it flakes off. It It is soft enough and it's at the point where it's good for the isopods to put in, even though I can't really break it up any further. So I usually go sort of one piece here, one piece over here, and maybe some more just flaked into the, the substrate. And they'll eat this, um, you know, same as like millipedes, etc. And that's just another thing that you should add in. And that is basically your initial isopod setup. So this would be good for porcelio, for armadillidium, um, in terms of cubaris, you really probably want less airflow. Um, you'd want to start off in a smaller tub. So my cubaris are in a one litre at the moment because I've only got five of them. So there's no point in putting them in higher because you'd lose them and also it's, it's too big for them. You, you can't really keep track of them. No, that's understandable. Yeah, um, but yeah, this amount of moss would be porcelio that are non-Spanish species, so like Lavis, Gabar, that kind of stuff, um, and armadillidium. If you had Spanish isopods, you'd probably go for that amount of moss. Yeah, so you'd half how it many, and just do a corner. How many different types of isopods have you got now? I've got 14 now. Ah. So I've got three like Spanish species. Pardon? Are some of them like your stock? Yeah, so technically all of them are my stock, but a lot of them are still cultivating. Um, but all of them are still personal pets. I, I love all of them the same. I mean, my Aniscus is seller, so selling quite well on eBay. Um, and they're just a, a native UK isopod. Um in the ice pod groups, people really sort of neglect them as an ice pod because they're UK. So Wait, they don't neglect them in a bad way. Show us. Yeah, I can show you. But um, in general, they kind of get pushed to the side a little bit. And it's quite sad because they're really pretty. Uh, which ones are they? Are you these ones? Uh, that's our binos, parakite, and then, as usual, they're at the bottom. <laughs> Oops, sorry. That's all right. I'm just trying not to kill my lighting setup. Of course, like a horror film now. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see these are a lot damper and humid than yeah, your other species. But being in the UK, have you ever been out in the UK and had just a sunny day without any rain? I can't remember the last time I had one. <laughs> Quite a while ago. Oh, they're just the common brown ones. Yeah, so they're the common shiny woodlouse. But some of them, like at the top there, you can see they've got the yellow speckle and they're really, really pretty. Oh, yeah. So they're like a bright form. And if I if I wanted to, I could probably separate some out and try and selectively breed to have the bright form. 
but you can see in here as well there's a, a real mix of color a real mix of like contrast and that so they're a very pretty species but they are mainly sort of like what people would use for feeders and stuff like that um and when i get lots of them i'll probably be able to do them as feeders for um black like snakes etc not not snakes lizards <laughs> We Can't imagine a snake would really find them Um, so I didn't find them myself. I got these ones from Nick. Um, Nick breeds these. Um, but I have seen them out in the wild. I've seen Armadillidium Armadillidium vulgare. I've seen Fulloscoria muscorum. Um, what other ones have I seen? Obviously the Acellus spinacornis. I've seen quite a few, like in my local woodland in Hartford as well. Hartford has a really wide range of isopods. There's also the Glomerus marginata, which are the um, UK native pill millipedes. So they're like isopods, but they're a millipede species. So they have two pairs of legs per body segment. Um, and they're quite cool. And then while I've been out and about, I've seen the stone centipedes that are the Lithobius. They look like little Dehanis. They're really cool. And uh, a few other bits like millipedes, etc. Yeah. yeah. How long are so, you planning on staying on the live today? Uh, well, I've covered what I wanted to cover. So we've done our set up. Um, if anyone's got any questions for me, I'll stick around for, say, another 20 minutes. If you need to dash off, then you're more than welcome to, Diana. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. It's been absolutely great having you. Yeah, I probably will do now because I'm going to get yeah, ready for school tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely fine. I understand that. So um, if anyone has any questions, I'll, I'll stay on for... Yeah, yeah, I'll see you soon. Get in touch with me and I'll try and sort you out. All right, I'll see you soon then. All right, bye. bye. So yeah, if I just stay on for another sort of 10 minutes, has anyone got any specific uh, questions? or um, any requests for upcoming lives or anything like that. Um, and if not, then uh, I'll call it a night. But I'll give you guys a chance to ask anything, um, and we'll go from there. see what crack says now when she's on about the moment of silence uh, while I'm waiting I'll see if I can get a couple of other species down and try and get some shots ten percent battery remaining that's always good Luckily, I've got the cable right here. So, in here, we have the Armadillidium perici. And I wanted to show these off because I've got some babies coming through now. And they're absolutely diddy, but they're so cute. And they darken with age. For some reason, these ones are absolutely huge compared to the ones that are in my hognose viv. So, really, really cool. Um, quite an underrated species. I mean, on the camera, they look quite sort of unappealing and a little bit sort of boring looking. But I can promise you that in person, they are really interesting because they're almost shivery. They've got a, a powdery kind of thing, like with the um, Porcelionides um, prunosis. And we have... Have we got any questions? What are your favourite pods to use in bioactive setups? Okay, so if I give you three scenarios, dart frogs, I would use a really damp loving species. So something like tropical dwarf whites and you could also try, I wouldn't try Kibaris because that's just ridiculous, but you can try stuff like your um, powders, your Lavis would probably be all right in there, um, and the 
Aniscus or Celis would actually excel in that kind of setup because they do well with being in a, a damper environment. For your semi tropical, like your burrow, etc. Oh, thank you, Ophi. That's really great. Um, I know it's just Rick watching, but um, it means a lot. And I'm I'm really glad that I've had so many people turn out to come and see me. Um, but for a semi tropical, so what I'd class as that is like your Central American, so your boas, um, Boa imperata, and your um, ball pythons over in Africa and that kind of situation. Um, Porcello Lavis, I don't think you can beat them. Porcello Escabar, um, I would say that you could try stuff like Armadillidium Kluge and um, Parakai, etc. But I would save Armalid Armadillidium species for the hognose and the arid species. Um, and then something that's more temperate, like a corn snake, I'd say powder greys, because they breed so fast, even if they dry out a bit. They'll usually outbreed the rate that they um, don't make it. So although it's a bit of a naff situation, they do work. And I've had powders in with my corn snake now for ages and they're still doing good. And I've had parakai in with my hognose now for um, the best part of five months. And they're still doing really good. They're actually breeding and I've got babies in there as well. So I hope that answers your question, Drew. So these are another Spanish species. These are my new absolute favourites out of what I currently keep. And these are the Porcelio Bolivari. And they're just absolutely incredible. Really, really great. And really fast. You can see they're, just, they're like old world tarantulas, but as I said, I'll try and get a good light in. So they look like aliens. Hopefully I'll get some breeding out of these. But at the moment they are juveniles. Um, they've got like a lotus pod in here. They've got their moss. Nothing under the moss at the moment. Um, and that's still quite nice um, humidity wise. So I'm not going to spray that. But you can see this is another one that I've done. Um, this was the same run but with my old glue gun you can see the the glue itself obviously didn't get as hot it's a lot less uniform so the new one's definitely a hell of a lot better oh uh, that's honestly diana i'm so glad to have you on, and uh, you're more than welcome anytime it was really great having some support and i'm really just getting to chat to you properly uh, i've shown you that one i'll show you that one Let's go for this one. And then, as long as I've got the right bin, which I'm almost 100% sure I have, um, when you get 14 species, it's really important to kind of put them back where you got them from. So you keep your order the same and then you know what you're picking up. But these are my Porcelio Hassi High Yellows. Another quite fast species. You can see really, really great colours. I've got quite a few in here. Some of them are really pretty. I think these are actually something some people will selectively breed out eventually. And they've got like a different hue on their, their spots. It's absolutely brilliant. But I've not seen any babies as of yet. Um, just doing a little female check. I sort of, when you're checking the females... What you can do is you can kind of look at a side profile and see if you can see like a little bit of a marsupium developing. And what a marsupium is, is basically their brood pouch. Um, and the other thing as well is a lot of the time with these Spanish species, the young will be closer to like the humid area. So it's really good to sort of have a look and see if you can spot any young around the humid area, which at the moment, unfortunately, I can't. No. Which isn't a bad thing. They do take a while to get established. Um, best bet with these species is to 
leave them be as much as possible. Don't interrupt them and uh, let them get jiggy with it without being too much of a burden. You know, you, you wouldn't want your uh, parents popping in every time you went to get it on. So uh, I can't imagine they'd want it. <laughs> So Drew has five and he gets confused. Still very new to the pod world. Um, oh, Wooly's in the chat. Hi, Wooly. Yeah, this was a bit of a unplanned. bit unplanned. Um, my co-host on the Exotics Radio podcast had to cut it off early. So I jumped on here to give people a bit more time. Um, I will be cutting it off now um, unless anyone's got any uh, questions before I go but um, hopefully you'll be able to watch it back and uh, I'd really appreciate some feedback if you do Wally um, everyone Supreme Gecko please go and check him out go and subscribe to him anyone that keeps isopods or wants to keep isopods needs this guy you know like look at all his videos taking all his care like it's literally like having uh, an isopod bible you know having his information and his like know-how on youtube is what's got me to where i am today and you know we're five years down um currently and and obviously going forward as well he's really reliable for anything you want to know even if he's got a new species the experience that he's got over the years means that he's got a, a general idea of what to do and uh the best way to kind of tackle a new setup. So if it's the first time keeping a Nucubaris species, um, he's generally got a good idea about the best way to tackle it. And he's given me some help with my Panda Kings as well. Um, so thank you very much, guys. I'm really, really, really just can't say thank you enough. Um, we're an hour and 20 minutes in basically, and we've got 10 viewers still. It's, it's amazing. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to see you again soon. I will be going live on Thursday night with um, Scott's Inverts and Bailey's Bug Blog. So if you guys are around and you'd like to check it out, um, I will be putting some promotional stuff up as soon as possible once a thumbnail is created. And uh, I hope to see you there. So thanks very much, and I'll see you on the next one. All right, bye.